Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar on supporting family mental health strategies for parents. We are delighted to have you join us for this important and very timely discussion. So this evening, we have the privilege of hearing from Samantha Rotaro, education psychologist and project manager of the Kiro Learning Support, and who will be guiding us through key insights and practical strategies to help future to help nurture mental health within your family. Joining Samantha is also uh, our special guest speaker, Melanie Lonsbach, and she's the counselor at Kiro High School, Durbanville. And we, and we will also share her expertise and um, on supporting learners and their families through these challenging times. Remember, um, throughout the sessions, we encourage you to engage with us by posting your questions in the Q&A section, and Samantha and Melandri will address as many of your questions as possible during our dedicated Q&A time at the end of the webinar, but I will also ask it uh, in between. So we hope the session will equip you with valuable tools to promote a supportive, balanced and mentally uh, healthy environment for your family. So let's get started. Melandri, I'm going to ask the questions to you. So let's start off with what are some basic subtle signs of anxiety or emotional distress that parents might miss in their children? So because um, I specifically work with teenagers and a lot of the times we do get um, situations where we say, oh, they're just being teenagers or they're just going through something. Um, but some of the subtle signs to look out for um, refers to increased irritability, um, maybe unprovoked irritability in that sense, um, changes in sleeping patterns. This might be oversleeping or sleeping too little or not at all, withdrawal from activities or friends, um, or withdrawing from activities or friends. Um, these include things that they, they usually really enjoy doing um, or people they usually enjoy spending time with. Um, furthermore, excessive worrying about school or social situations. We see this a lot when, when kids are really, really anxious and they try to identify spaces that, that could create more anxiety or pile onto that anxiety as well. Another key thing to look out for is physical um, symptoms. We call them somatic symptoms. Um, these include stomach aches or headaches, sometimes um, neck pain or back pains, physical things that happen to our bodies that, that seem out of the ordinary. Um, other things could include changes in appetite or extreme feelings of overwhelm um, without explicitly stating that they are anxious. So you, it's it's kind of like a visual overwhelm that you can see on them. Yeah. Samantha? So with the, with the older children, I, I like that you mentioned us always saying, oh, but they're just teenagers, you know. Um, it's important to be able to differentiate between anxiety and just teenagers. And that brings us to understanding adolescent, what is happening with them and what that mental and physical development looks like. So when we look at, let's just take sleeping, for example. Yes, they're going to start sleeping more. It's going to be a period of more sleep. But I think it's, it's we fine tune it to the difference between the motivation to to get up. So yes, they're going to be sleeping more, but when it comes to getting up, are you able to motivate them? There's also a big difference there when it comes to those that are anxious and sleeping more to hide away. Um, it's going to be extreme avoidance, whereas those that are just, you know, teenagers and <laughs> wanting to sleep more, you're going to be able to roll them out of the bed and they're going to land up in the bathroom eventually. So that's a subtle difference we need to be be careful of. Um, and I think with the younger children, it's the excessive um, irritability. You know, they're, they're upset, but they don't really know why they're upset. I think especially for children in the um, foundation phase, often they don't have the words, they don't understand what they're feeling. But that's a very important point that you made, the over-irritation, the kind of, you know, whether it's the... The book fell and now it's a big tantrum because the book fell. So the excessive emotion doesn't match the action. Those are kind of big crucial areas. Because I think it, that's the challenge for parents is to differentiate between normal mood fluctuations and mental health concerns. And I think that 
Melandri is the big question for parents most of the time. So it it is a bit of a struggle sometimes to try and identify when this is now a serious situation or is a serious problem on, on our hands. Um, but a lot of the times it is important to just trust your gut as well. I mean, you, you know your child, you know how they are usually, and you also know how they are when they, they're going through a difficult time. So kind of comparing different situations or, or looking at previous situations where the same thing might have happened and now we see a very different reaction to it could, could also be quite a, a subtle but an important sign. So, so when should parents seek professional help? When is the, what is the right time? When should they do it? So I'm definitely of the opinion that professional help is, is always a good idea. Um, even if things are going great, um, I do believe that, that having someone to chat to in a, in a confidential space is, is important. It contributes to that consistency that we'll talk about later on. Um, but a very clear indicator of a, a problematic situation happening or starting to to fester is the the length of the the mood fluctuation or the shift in in how they react or their behavior. Um, mm -hmm. If it's if it's prolonged in that sense, it's really important to start figuring out what is our next point of action, because what we're doing at this point has obviously not supported them to get through what they're going through at this point. Another thing to look out for is signs of distress, such as self-harm or substance abuse or very drastic behavioral changes. Um, self-harm is a difficult thing to look out for, especially in teenagers, because they've become really smart in hiding them. Um, but connecting back to those subtle hints is child who's wearing a hoodie or or excessively warm clothes in the in the summer or um pulling down sleeves excessively and uh, kind of like hiding specific parts of of their body from being in a space where it can be perceived um another important thing to look out for is when the child is expressing or feeling hopelessness or worthlessness um especially if if this hasn't been something that they've been struggling with, or we see this in, in very strong academic candidates as well, when they become really, really stressed, they all of a sudden feel as if they're never going to achieve anything. And this might be because of a small um, fluctuation in marks or a, a drop in marks. But it is really important that we do identify that kids really have a all or nothing perspective on on life at this point so it's either all good or it's all bad and I'm drowning um, mm -hmm. so as soon as it gets to that point where a child feels like nothing I do is going to help what's the point of doing anything um, I'm never going to achieve my goals anyways um, that's when we have to step in and intervene Sam because for many parents, when you say seek professional help, mm. that little phrase is, is is something that parents battle with because there is a yeah. bit of an acknowledgement in it, but it's also mm. um, they see it as a before we even seek professional help, they think it's diagnosed.